Bold Predictions, chapter 27. What do you believe so much that you would bet your own money on? Well, we're on chapter 27, so obviously a lot, but let's dive in tonight. And the first one, it takes us to some familiar foes, even though they rarely play each other. Dustin says, the USC offense will finish the season 30 spots higher in points per game than Oklahoma. So yeah, a bunch of you probably don't have this scale memorized in your head. Oklahoma, under Lincoln Riley, was never worse than eighth in the country in points per game. So they were always up there. Now, uh, by comparison, his, his new place of business, USC, was 65th in points per game last year. So there's some work to do there. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to assume with all the transfer moves. I'm just going to assume Lincoln Riley has a top 15, maybe even a top 10 points per game offense this year. Let's go top 12. Why not? So top 12 points per game offense. Now, at Oklahoma... Jeff Levy, new offensive coordinator there. Last two years at Ole Miss, 14th and 24th in points per game. We could reasonably expect that they'll dial it back a little bit in terms of tempo. We could reasonably expect a little more ground and pound and maybe not so much through the air. But is it going to be 30 spots worse? That's where producer Jesse and I disagreed. He gave me my stat pack today, and in that stat pack is included producer Jesse's own 1 to 10 boldness scale on these sorts of things. And... Um, I differed with him. I say this is a six, and it's a six. Here's what I have to take into account. I have to take into account injury, even though you don't predict it and you never hope for it. But if Oklahoma, if Dylan Gabriel misses any time at quarterback, I'm not necessarily crazy about what they have there. And even if he doesn't miss time, you got a lot of adjustment. You've got a lot of replacement, a lot of churn that has to happen offensively at Oklahoma. You probably have a little bit different style there, although Jeff Levy is a pretty dependable commodity at this point. Uh, I don't doubt as much the points they're going to put up at USC. Now, whether they stop folks frequently enough, that's a whole nother topic. But I, I think this has a reasonable chance of happening. I'm going to call it a six on the boldness scale and no more. I think that's something that could come to fruition. Next up, this is not fun to talk about, but we have to talk about it. Kenneth said, Scott Frost, Nebraska head coach, he will not make it to the end of the season. I put an eight on this because obviously this is the disaster scenario for Husker fans. The preseason number I think they have set for him is bowl game. So six. I think he has to have six wins this year. The over-under is seven and a half. Even if they lose to Oklahoma, which is the, it's the week three game, but it's their fourth game of the year. Even if they lose to Oklahoma... If they start out 3-0 and and then lose that game, they're 3-1. and Here's what comes after the Oklahoma game. Indiana, at Rutgers, at Purdue, Illinois. So, there are many, many paths here where they're all ready to five or six wins before they even get to November. And I believe they should be there before they get to November. Now, the reason I mentioned November is because it is a tough close. They've got Minnesota at Michigan, Wisconsin at Iowa to close the season. But you could already be out of the woods. You could already be in the six or seven win club and not have to worry so much about whether we can pull upsets in November. Now, they may be flying so high that they can be competitive in November too. But if they if they are already badly banged up record-wise before they even get out of October, then this is a possibility. I just don't think they're going to be badly enough banged up by the time they get out of October. And I think he's going to be allowed to finish the end of the season if he gets to November. So I'm saying this is an eight. I think Scott Frost, well, you know my feelings on Nebraska this year. I think they're going to be a seven-win team. So I think he'll be okay, moot point. Uh, but I definitely think even if he doesn't make it, I do think he makes it to the end of the season before something happens. And we're talking regular season there. Next up, uh, this one's kind of interesting because I did not know that this had happened so frequently. Cam said Alabama's going to win the West. And the second place team will be three or more games behind them in the division standings. SEC West is cannibalism. Uh, that's from Gulf Shores, Alabama. How many times do you think this has happened under Saban, that Alabama won the West and they finished three or more games ahead of whoever the next closest team was? Keep in mind, they only play eight conference games. So that means you've got to be 8-0 and, and then second place is 5-3 and three or worse. Believe it or not, it's happened four times. Most recently in 2018, uh, 2016, 2009, and 2008. Saban's second and third years there, they did this. And every time, they were 8-0, and the next closest team was 5-3. So presumably, let's just say this happens this year. 
you have to have Bama go 8-0. So they have to just run the table in conference. I would think A&M, you know, just using Vegas numbers, A&M would be the next team in line. Bama's preseason over-under win total is 11. A&M's preseason over-under win total is 8.5. So that's a two and a half game gap. Now that's taking into account the entire schedule, not just conference games. So who knows? A&M, you know, they play Miami. They could lose there. Bama could lose to Texas and it wouldn't impact this. But this isn't so crazy. I made it a seven and a half. It's not so crazy because think about it. If Bama's undefeated, then by default, they've already handed everyone a loss. And also there is that very real cannibalistic scenario that was mentioned here where you've got one elite team and just a bunch of good teams. And good teams beat good teams. That's what happens. That is the nature of college football cannibalism. And so I made this one a seven and a half. It's not crazy. It's unlikely, but it's not crazy. Next up, this one, I made an eight on the boldness scale. And this one is Clemson and Oklahoma. Both miss out on the conference championship game again. Making it. They miss out on making the conference championship game. I made this an eight. Uh, Clemson is a minus 190 favorite to just make the conference title game. They're a minus 120 to win the whole conference. And they're, they're the fourth favorite to win the national championship. Now, in the Big 12, obviously, they don't have the divisional play. Oklahoma is plus 220 to win the Big 12. So the Big 12, this is not hard to see at all. The Big 12 is totally wide open. I think it is the most competitively balanced or maybe most unpredictable conference in all of college football this year. Like, I'm going to make a case later where I may convince myself Baylor wins the conference. I was texting back and forth with Trey Scott last night, and I was, I was talking myself into it. Yesterday on the Late Kick Extra podcast, I was talking myself into it, and we still got like a month. I'm going to end up talking myself into that probably. So the Big 12 is wide open. It's, it's not hard to envision Oklahoma not playing for the conference title. There are many paths in which the Sooners don't play for it, even though they're the favorite to get there, or one of the favorites. But in the ACC, for Clemson not to play for it again, you're talking about a, a pretty big story, one of the bigger stories in college football this year, and that's me not even knowing what happens in the rest of the country. If Dabo Swinney and Clemson aren't playing for the conference title again, think about that. That obviously means everybody's biggest fears about losing Venables and losing Tony Elliott, they have manifest themselves. It means quarterback has not been figured out for a second consecutive year. It means that you get further and further down that rabbit hole of talking about whether the game is passing Dabo Swinney by. You know this whole song and dance of if the worst were to happen. I just think Clemson's going to be there. So I don't think that we're going to be having those conversations. As a result, I made this an eight. Maybe one of them, but, but I definitely think at least one of them is going to play for a conference title. Uh, the last one here, let's go back to the Big 12 for a second. Oklahoma State finally wins the Big 12. They won it in 2011, I think, and they haven't won it since then. So the Cowboys win in the Big 12. I think in terms of odds, they're number three right now, and Baylor's number four, and they're both behind OU and Texas. They have got a surprisingly poor schedule dynamic this year. They don't have a single bye in conference play meaning they play three out-of-conference games to start the year. They play Central Michigan, Arizona State, and Arkansas Pine Bluff, and that's where their bye comes in. And then starting in October, October 1st, that's when they go to Baylor. It's their first Big 12 game. They play an entire conference schedule back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back. To back to back to back to back. They do not have an off week. So that is less than desirable. Their road games include at TCU, at Kansas State, at Oklahoma, at Baylor, the defense got gutted, including losing their defensive coordinator. And I just, I, I know what the odds say. But I, I was higher on them last year than I am this year. Spencer Sanders is back at quarterback, and he's going to get a lot of hype, and rightfully so. Right, he will win games for them this year. Winning the conference, though, is something that I think we may look back on last year and say, didn't know it at the time, but that's as close as they were going to get, you know, with this current crop of players. So I'm going to call this an eight on the boldness scale. Oklahoma State, solid team, uh, just not quite feeling them as much this year as I was, especially down the stretch last year.